part of the problem of doing research with, on tribes in Oregon is uh, Oregon was settled very early, uh, earlier than the Midwest, than you know what we call the West, or much of the West, like the Plains area and stuff. So uh, you know, it's it's kind of funny. People, uh, a lot of people don't don't study history, don't really understand this so well. That you know, the the, the Indian Wars of the Plains happened some 30 to 40 years after Oregon was already settled and already was the tribes already on reservations. So all that whole, that whole cowboy period that we see in movies and stuff really happened 30 to 40 years after Oregon was already done. You know, the tribes already kind of like moved on. And so uh, because of that, um, that's actually just after that sort of period of time uh, was the invention of sort of anthropology and anthropological studies got going. And uh, so it took 30 to to 50 years for anthropologists to come around and start asking questions of the tribes or other reservations. And uh, so much of the context, much of the story, much of the culture, and even language is gone, or was gone by that time. And so what I do, and people like me do, and there's, there's like about a half dozen people like me that, that, that research this, this stuff in Oregon, is try to sort of piece together what we can out of uh, all kinds of sources, whether you know newspaper accounts, journals, ethnographic accounts, uh, you know, historic accounts, um, folklore, uh, linguistic stuff. You know, so all so all this stuff comes to play in putting together these histories, and and we try to also try, I also try to throw in a little bit of what did the native people think about this stuff, what was going on, and so because that's not always. Uh, focused on by many of the common um, popular histories about Oregon. Many historians didn't really care, seemed to not care at all what tribes thought about their colonization. We'll introduce the tribes first. Uh, first off, show conditions, mainly show conditions on this map. This is a map I put together a couple of years ago based on really the 1851 treaties. Um, uh, the 51 treaties were never ratified. Um, there were there were trees, 19 trees in Oregon. There were 18 trees in California at the same time period. And in those treaties, uh, they kind of start really kind of right here, and they, they go up this direction, up and down the coast. There's some in the southern Oregon. There's a, there's a bunch in the in the Lot Valley. But these trees were never sort of like mapped before, that right, I could tell. And so what I did, I put together a map based on the descriptions. And this is what it kind of looked like. And this is not one of the, the, the Columbia River treaties, the 12 that I put in here for comparison. But we, these are both uh, Tillamook treaties right here. And then we have Chinookan tribal treaties. This is the Clatsup. This is the Wakayakum over here. And this is the lower band, the Wheelopin Bay, the Shoalwater Bay at the top. And these are not like perfect. You know, there's not perfect lines of the landscape to show you exactly where the trees were. Uh, and then we have the Klaskanai here, which were not a Chinookan people. They were actually uh, uh, Athabascan-speaking peoples that happened to be here. And if, you, if you've read my blog at all, you know I, I kind of figured out where they came from. They actually were a people that uh, migrated here some six, seven hundred years ago from up north. They came down. There was a giant fire. It burned out their whole territory, and then they they moved south to get away from the, the sort of desolate landscape of that giant fire, and they figured out there was a lot of elk on this side of the river, so they moved here. Um, and then we have Maloma, Cascades, and Clackamas. Uh, and then the other, I threw in the other uh, Chilkin tribes for comparison. We have other sort of uh, Hood River, Dogger, Cascades, Wishrum, Wasco, and Deschutes here. So. And that's kind of um, the extent of the Chinookan territory as far as we know. Part of the problem of, of, of these stories is that this is a timed account. So 1851 was, uh, was about 20 years after uh, a bunch of diseases came through, like malarial diseases, if you read any kind of Robert Boyd work and stuff. And that, that wiped out something like 95% of some tribes. Uh, 85, 75 to 95% of the Chinookan people, depending on what tribe you're talking about. And so the the tribal makeup before that was likely very different because because what happens in, in a disease you know sort of pandemic like that uh, like as you know you go through one right 
not to the same extent of death, but it was, uh, you know, pretty disastrous in many ways economically. Like all the tribal villages were had their own autonomy. They had they had a structure, a chief structure, headman structure, and they could choose whether or not they, they aligned with other tribes. And generally, most people, most tribes, most villages were aligned with powerful chiefs. And so, the biggest power, most powerful chief on the Columbia, and the sort of the middle to, la to latter part, or middle part of the of the 19th century was Chief Kiasno, and he lived about right here in around Scapoose, St. Helens area, and uh, he had a village there, or several villages there, and so he actually uh, had alliances with all the Saudi Island folks, we call Wapso Island also at the time, and he had alliances across the river on the, on the, on the north side too. Uh, and so he was, he happened to be in, in kind of charge of the tribes in this, of this area, he was the big chief in the area, and all the, all the, the tribes in the area looked to him for guidance. A lot of Native people went to Fort Vancouver to sort of get jobs and to sort of be a part of that sort of new wealth tradition that was growing up, the new economy of, of fur trade. And he was someone in charge of those people too. So he, he directed actions, he had the, had the ear of people in the fort. He could actually go inside the fort, which is not really always common, and uh, eat with the white people, the, the fur traders, and with uh, McLaughlin. And uh, he was respected because he, he didn't make war upon the fur traders, uh, and he got fairly wealthy off that. Um, and his wives are probably also uh, very wealthy, and very powerful too, because uh, you know they're not talked about much in histories. They um, they had somebody, a big chief, that was in charge of things. So uh, they would probably direct the actions of the women. And so a lot. So. What, what Charlie were doing back then was they were learning new trade, or the fur trade. They already had a trade system on the Columbia, so there's like this giant trade system on the Columbia called the Columbia River Trade Network, which went all the way up to Columbia, all the way down to the Snake River and everything, and back to the ocean here. But, the, but when the fur traders came along, they had to learn a new trade system, uh, trading their uh, uh, you know, furs for the new European products. You know, things like metals, guns, knives, metal pans, um, clothing, fabrics, beads, and whatever else they had that was new and, and exciting. So, you know, and so that, that's, that's what they, that's that new economy was built up around the fur trade. Uh, and it caused a lot of, of cultural changes. You can imagine, you know, if somebody came along with new stuff, and you want that stuff, you're going to like trade everything you have to get that. And uh, at first, much of that stuff was a wealth, wealth items because it only the chiefs could afford to get it. And later on, it became more common. Things like guns were reserved like that for a while. Um, but uh, but Kiasno had the allegiances and he had uh, intermarriages with many, many people up and down the Columbia. I don't know if you read the accounts from the 19th century, but. One of his wives, and he had several wives, and look at this, like most tribal people back in the day, one of his wives came from the class of people, it was one of the daughters of, of Chief Kunkamli, uh, and then he had, uh, he mentions at some point that he has uh, relatives with the Cascades people, and then he mentions he has in-laws with the Tualatin, and then he goes and visits on occasion the other Calaquia tribes like the San Yam, which are very powerful people. So there was a period of time in like around 1812, 1813, when you know the Astorians were here and um, the Calas people from up north came down on the Calas River and began to invade the Columbia, thinking they were going to take over a part of it. And he, he called his, uh, his alliance into the river, all the canoes from his the allied peoples to the river, and he was able to force it to go back. Um, and, you know, uh, various ethnographers have said that he could call a thousand men into the river at any time. Let's get down to the Calaquians. So the Calaquians were all throughout the Willamette Valley uh, and into the Umpqua Valley as well. So the Yonkalas span the, the Calaquia Mountain Divide from essentially 
about Pleasant Hill down into um, the Umpqua Valley. And then, so uh, the big powerful tribes were Tualatin, Sandiam, were probably the most powerful in the valley. The Sandiam especially, I think, were the most powerful. They had allegiances from the Pudding River or Hayatuk people. They had allegiances down here with the Tekapa, the Chippen, the Peyu, the Winfley, and then they had a well, they had also kinship down there too. And then they also had kinship with various bands of the Malala too. So there was the sort of northern Malala, there was also a Saniam Forks band of Malala, there was also a mountain band of Malala out here. So all these tribes in various genealogy who discovered that they were all interrelated. And my ancestry before the reservation had people of the Sandiam and the Malala and the Yonkala and the Abramqua all married together, and, and even relations with the Wascos, the Klamath down south, you know, all this stuff. All these people are interrelated, and it comes through my Santiam line to Grand Ronde. And that's before the reservation. At the reservation, it becomes, you know, there's some 27 to 32 tribes that were sort of confederated together at Grand Ronde, my, my reservation, and there creates new allegiances, new kinship, you know, new genealogies and stuff from that. So, but it wasn't the case that intertribal marriage was uh, forced. That was always the case. We just, just happened happen to have a new kind of new kind of math the reservation. So, so here's there's a lot of tribes here. I think um, Henry Zink, one of the foremost scholars of the Calhouns, uh, suggested at one point there was 17 tribes throughout the valley, and that's, that's because a lot of the villages probably had a lot of independence from other villages, but these are the major ones up and down the valley that we know of. This area clearly is the Tualatin Atfalati place. Um, uh, tribe, the tribe today calls them Tualatin, not, usually, not really using the, the name Atfalati, mainly because Tualatin is actually written into our treaties. So that treaty language um, has been ratified by the federal government as a ratified treaty, we have to use that language. So all the tribal documents are going to use Tualatin rather than Atfalati, even though the original name was, was likely Atfalati. Most suggestions from scholars were 15,000 or so Californians, clearly round numbers didn't exist, but um, you know, there's some sort of, of range between 15,000 to 20,000 Californians at some point. There was an earlier uh, epidemic that happened around the 1770s, probably from visitations by merchant marine and exploratory ships up the coast uh, of smallpox. And so that likely also took, you know, a good third of the people away at that point in the 1770s. And so the population in the 19th century becomes uh, kind of a surviving population from that. And then we have another epidemic of malaria in uh, around uh, 1830. And then after um, the big next uh, epidemics happen in the 1850s, when there's not many, many more settlers in the area that bring a lot more stuff with them, you know, microbes with them. And uh, there's many more vis visitations on the coast, uh, virtual marine, other folks that are coming into Oregon, coming for gold and other, other things. The people in the, in, the, in the Lana Valley are pretty much wiped out by malaria. 97% is the figure from Zinc at one point. And then, and that's, that malaria epidemic is going to be different from what you see on the coast. The coast uh, had like a lot of more venereal diseases, a lot more you know, other kind of things that were brought by merchant marine uh, because malaria is by and large spread by mosquitoes, and mosquitoes do not like ocean breezes for whatever reason. I don't know. Uh, they don't like it, so it's not going to do very well on the coast. I mean, people could have clearly been, been infected, got over to the coast, and there's not a lot of mosquitoes that are going to like carry it around. It's further down southern Oregon, so we start to see a difference. The landscape is much more rough. There's a lot more mountains. There's a lot more. Uh, and some of these mountains, I, I would I would say, I mean, I think that in epidemiology they say that a lot of mountain ranges cause uh, kind of like barriers to diseases at times, because people are less likely to travel across like a snow-packed mountain range than... And, and so, anyway, so you don't see the same 
uh, disease profile in the south, in the Umpqua uh, Basin, in the Siskiyous, in the River Basin, as you see in the, in the Wyoming Valley because of that, because there's because uh, people are doing less traveling, perhaps back and forth between the tribes. Uh, there's not a lot of travel in the wintertime across the Cascades. And then there's less, less uh, explorers and gold miners coming through this area than there, than there was in the north. Okay, so the upper Umpqua are Athabascans. The Cow Creek Umpqua, Band of Umpquas are just on the Umpqua River, but they are actually Tekelma speakers like the Rogue River peoples. The, the Tekelma is down here. Uh, the Malawas have a different language. California has a different language, the Uncalas. And then we have the uh, lower empire that come into the basin a little bit over the hill, over the coast range, and they uh, speak a totally different language. They're speaking uh, kind of a relative of Kus and Sayusla. Down here we have, uh, I think it's talked about like 1,200 years ago, there was an Athabascan migration from the north that lands at a place called Yontaket in northern California. Those people at that place become the Talawa of Northern California. They spread out up the coast to become the Tugni, Rogue River people coming in this way, which are the Athabascans, it, uh, coming up the, the Rogue and the uh, uh, Illinois River. And then, uh, then we also see like Upper Umpqua are the same dot or, or a similar dialect of these folks. So the Upper Umpqua are, are Athabascans while the the Coquel and Coos are speaking a different and then so this kind of isolate language which are related Millic and, and Hannes. Um, and so, and then we have Shastas coming from the south. The Shastas, um, northern Shastas are up to at least Ashland with probably lots of hunting and the gathering in, 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 the, in, the, in the basin. So, uh, and then we had also Klamath people coming over and hunting and stuff, so there's Lots of stuff going on. Lewis and Clark is really helpful. Like, you read the, the, the journals and stuff, especially the 1806 journals, because they're going back and they're actually discovering new things they didn't see before when they came to the West. They traveled down the Columbia in 1806. They stop, you know, at a, at a village about right here. And then Clark gets in a boat with a Klali Walla man, Klali Walla man, and they travel back to this river they missed, which they call the Multnomah, which is actually the Willamette. Uh, and he goes about 10 miles down the river, makes a lot of observations, stops at one point at a, at a single plank house, which is this Kuala Wala man's uh, father's residence, gets some more information from him, and then they go back, join the, join the expedition. There are several maps off that, so if you want to look at the, the maps at the Beinecke Library on, online at the Yale, you know, you can, you can download them. So, but... What it looks like, in terms of like the ethnographic evidence afterwards, is that there's this relationship between the Monoma, the Cascades people that come initially from the Cascades uh, Rapids area, which are now Cascade Locks, and the Clackamas people, and the Kalawala people were right, were right at the falls. That they're all interrelated, that when the chiefs down here in Oregon City passed on in like the late 40s, 1840s, uh, there's a there's an account of how uh, Tomaquin up at the Cascades got together with the people down here, and they decided that his sons would come down and become the chiefs of, of the of, in Oregon City. In fact, uh, Lewis and Clark documents this. You go and, and read the journals. They're seeing people from Upriver and Downriver, from Klickitat people, from, you know, all over the place. Malala people. They're they're, they're talking to different people in the same location where there's uh, Cascades villages right here in what we call now the Portland Basin. And he actually witnesses them in 1806 packing up their belongings, all the houses themselves, taking them apart, and then, and then canoeing them back up the river to re-erect them at the Cascade Rapids in time for the, for the spring salmon run, which is about nearly now in the year. So they're actually seeing in you know 3D, uh, uh, people actually uh, going through their seasonal round, changing their residence uh, based on what what resources are available, and why the reason why they're in this area. Uh, we need to really pay attention sometimes when we read this stuff. Is the wapato? Wapato is a, a native crop 
it's everywhere. And they see on the side of the river something like a hundred of these really small canoes, and I call them now Wapto canoes, probably single person canoes that people were using, uh, probably to harvest the Wapato because it was everywhere. It was in all of the, the sloughs and swamps and ponds and swales and whatever in the area that was sort of overflow and you know, constant, constantly wet all the time, this, this vast wetland of Portland. And uh, Salve Island is talked about as having massive ponds full of Wapato. So that's, that's really what it's all about. It's not about fishing in, the, in this area of Portland. It's not about the salmon. It's all about the Wapato. That's why they're there. They move literally in October, pack up their houses and everything. Thousands of people move down, set up a village here, where they probably have been setting up for hundreds and thousands of years, and begin processing Wapato. And, and then they spend, the, they spend the winter here, and I'm like, why is that? Well, because it's really freaking cold in the morning. So <laughs> they'd rather be a little bit warmer in this area. And so when it gets a little bit warmer and the spring should have come, they, they, or just before that, they come up here and they set up house again. Then the definition of permanence changes. Permanence is really, in their, in their world, it's not agriculture. They don't have a farm. They have this sort of gathering, hunter-gatherer, hunter and fishing gathering, what they call complex hunter fishing hunter gathering uh, cultures that are utilizing a vast area of the river as their place. And they're, they're sharing that with all these other tribes too. There's no, there's no lines. They, they're respectful. They're not going to stick their village into somebody else's village. They're going to be a little bit further away. But, but there's not a lot of conflict there. They're trying to have a trade relationship. They're, they're intermarrying with folks. They're they're trying to get wealthy off of the land. Well, here's kind of a picture of the fishing culture back in the day. Uh, There's no uh, photographs till much later of the tribe. Some people did like drawings and woodcuts and things. These are all like woodcuts at some level. Uh, we have Swan here, and we have other folks drawing these things, Drayton and stuff. Um, and so we see, uh, you know, Lion Falls in the background there. This was kind of interesting because the, the, the plank house is very rude, which is probably the case. They didn't have mill lumber. So they, they put stuff together out of what they could split, what they could find them on, you know, driftwood, that kind of stuff. A woman here cooking. And then we have a woman here also tending to something. Perhaps this looks like it could be a, a fish drying rack like they have even today at Salilo. Um, they have people in the water here, you know, on their canoe, and they have the, the falls in the background. Um, here we see at the falls, then, people, uh, mostly men, um, using their, their dip nets to dip for salmon. Uh, this is what the Wilkes Exhibition saw when Drayton took this image. There's two images like this from Drayton. And we see they're already adopting sort of European clothing. Got this European coat on, you know, this tailored coat. Uh, and they have their fish here, they're dragging the fish back to be processed by, usually by women. Uh, and there's various styles of fishing. We have, you know, dip netting. Looks like a spear or maybe a dip net. I don't know. And then we have somebody up in the water here. Uh, so we have this uh, season around put together for the Columbia. We have different camps set up in a seasonal way through uh, where they have like hunting camps and in the winter village, hunting camps, spring Chinook, probably canvas camp not too late after that. Weed materials, huckleberry, probably a trade gathering or two in the meantime, uh, acorn camp, more weed materials, uh, and then we have fall uh, salmon uh, camp, fall prairie fire, so we're getting to the Calico year, and they have a little bit different season around than what you hear about for the, for the chickens. Their season around is really kind of more based on what looks like to me vegetables, you know, like digging crops from the land, these and things. Uh, this is a calendar that was copied down in the 1870s by Albert Gatchett, uh, who came to Grand Ron and got it from somebody. And so, um, and they, they lay out a 12 month calendar. Everything is like around Camas or Wapato, and there's only one mention of hunting. There's no mention of fishing. Doesn't mean they didn't do more hunting or fishing. Maybe it's, it's, I think it's maybe because it wasn't as important. Because 
In the valley, it's talked about in many, many accounts that there's plenty of, of elk and deer. You ne they're never going to run out. Today, they're running out, but they're never going to run out. And uh, fishing was not a big deal because while there is fish, there's, there's salmon in the rivers. Um, they don't have like giant fishing falls, like, except for Willamette Falls, which is kind of owned by the Kuala Wala people. So to get a lot of fish, it's better to sort of gather a lot of canvas, gather a lot of wapato, and then trade whatever extra you have at Willamette Falls for, for salmon or salmon products. In this time period, settlers are coming in, 1840s, and beginning changing the land from a native camas prairie, mostly camas prairie, to, to crop lands where they're monocropping the land with just a few uh, cash crops that they can actually export out of Oregon. They're not necessarily using it in Oregon, they're exporting out of Oregon for, to make um, a cash from that and causing many changes to the land. So here's that uh, canvas environment. We have some pretty good pictures from uh, Bush Park in, Oregon, in, in, uh, in Salem. And so we have this nice oak savanna with canvas underneath. It'd be a pretty good place to have not just one but two crops at the same time if you were going to harvest maybe in September. The Tualatin doing that. They, they said in, in the notes that they would roast or probably dry out the acorns in this, or actually cook the, the sorry, cook the, the camas in the same pits as they, as they used for acorns. So there may have been several time periods of the year where you could actually get camas, where people got camas there. On the calendar you just saw, there was an early period before they flowered where they were to Canis. And I call that a starvation crop. People that were coming out of the winter, that, that had run out of stores, you know, they are running out of dry goods, and uh, they were then going out in the fields where the new Canis was, because it grows like this, and you're, it's gonna be everywhere. And so you can dig it just before it flowers, and then wait to, then after it flowers, you stop digging it. Other stuff is coming uh, in, and you can wait then till the midsummer to dig it again. And then you can also dig it late summer, again, when you're back in that same environment collecting acorns.